Hey, Sarah. So it looks like you got, uh, you got the invitation again. <laughs> yeah, I did. Do you need me to, uh, do you need to like get Wes on a call? And what I attempted to do is to send the invitation via text message this time to both of you. So it was a new method for both. And I was hoping that would come through on Wes's phone, but I'm not sure what's happening. Exactly. You sent it. You sent there it he is. To me. There he is. All right. Oh. Right. Okay. <laughs> we can start. We can start this for real now. So welcome back to Potter's Pockets, episode 11. Um, uh, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11. And um, for those of you listening, we're going to have quite a few outtakes episodes appended <laughs> to the end of this one because apparently not only Ron's wand is uh, sort of broken. <laughs> And messing with his ability to use magic, but technology with us, we like the students at Hogwarts have not yet mastered uh, the technology completely. And sometimes we are at the mercy of it completely, not understanding its forces. And so we have had an odyssey getting Mr. Wesley Chance on here. It's so we been, are. It's been very a, ro- a, a rogue app. Um, yeah, well, the rogue- direct link seemed to work. All right. So here we go. It's almost oh. as if. It's almost as if a member of the party were petrified and we had to apply <laughs> one some mandrake potion in order to bring him back. And so we developed our own sort of smaller or like uh, self-contained connection in pursuit of bringing you back into the fold and into the party. And we've been successful and we're now restored and stronger. Like, sort, of, sort of like the idea you, you put forward in your, your episode on bookworm games today on earthbound and that being a part of a party with people and engaging in a shared narrative towards a shared goal seems to strengthen each member in the party that it's that it's not that one person benefits but all sort of like all the dwarves and bilbo and the hobbit and sort of like harry and his friends which is what's so ridiculous about ron getting jealous of harry because of course the light of harry adds to the light of ron um, because he is, of course, the friend of the famous one, which does make him famous, if, even if not as famous. And, and perhaps that's what we're doing here in our conversation, as we, like when we were kids, would talk with walkie-talkies about whatever it was that we dreamed <laughs> about in the future. We now have the even better, the super walkie-talkies that allow us to record our thoughts that we have with each other for, uh, in a way that perhaps will last until, as far as we can... Uh, think it the end of time somewhere in the ether yeah yeah or right on and so perhaps this is hogwarts and so just to get down to it there were four topics that we really wanted to talk about today plus probably more bins professor bins history of magic professor extraordinaire is finally interrupted first time seemingly ever and so we'll talk about that we're talking about also um how dumbledore has a secret chamber at the top of the castle in the same way that there is a chamber of secrets with a snake in the bottom of the castle. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a figure of Odin on the tree Yggdrasil, the father god at the top, and the Midgard serpent at the bottom, at the roots. And so perhaps a a commentary on the reflection of that which is uh, high and above and that which is low like the old um uh greek poem heaven above heaven below stars above stars below suggesting that uh the macrocosm is reflected in the microcosm the divine and man and um and well such so on and so forth um we wanted to talk about the rogue bludger too and prayer and i had suggested potentially in our pre-talk that that was maybe the ability of negative public attention or negative public opinion to actually physically affect or negatively affect one's life. And then, uh, of course, uh, we have to talk about our resident, most famous person alive for uh, being the best at everything ever, Mr. Gilderoy Lockhart. And um, his, uh, his sort of ability to disarm even the, the best of students. And so we'll have to talk about that, too. So welcome back, y'all, too. All right. Good to be here. Yeah. Good to have you, Mr. West Chance. Good to have you. It was almost as if you were the one who was being uh, targeted by the rogue bludger in this case. Um, and so, God, well, let's, yeah, go on. I'm sorry. The, the rogue bludger uh, connects to the um, 
the the loss of Harry's um, bone entirely there. And hmm. so I was curious if you could maybe explain a little more how that idea about negative public opinion would then lead into the complete lack of bone structure whatsoever, <laughs> if you want to run with that for a minute. All right. So, okay. I, I have one thought and I have another thought and we'll see if I can connect them at all. That'll be real magic if I can. But the one is that I, I thought that um, the rogue bludger represented pub negative public opinion because for one, Harry is actually experiencing negative public opinion as people tar start to suspect him of being um, the heir to Slytherin uh, yeah. potentially. There are circumstantial, uh, there's circumstantial evidence that is starting to mount against him. Um, he's there with Mrs. Norris the cat. Uh, this Finch Fletchley guy is, uh, doesn't like him and feels targeted by him. This will come a little bit later, but we did read it for this time. And then he shows up petrified. And then we find out that, um, and Harry finds out too, that he is a parcel mouth and means he can speak parcel tongue. And so he's, he's and, and the sorting hat tells him he would have done great in Slytherin. And so there's really a, 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 a lot indicating that he's potentially the next Voldemort and is doing this, these evil deeds at the castle. And, it, that, and so part of, I think, the magic of this text is it conveys to us just the meaning of a situation through getting us to identify with an emotive response. Uh, how would we feel in that situation? Like we were getting hit or knocked out of the air, like we were picked out unjustly for something we hadn't done and that it could, would actually um, diminish us to such a point that it were as if we were disarmed or incapacitated in some way. And uh, I know that sounds sort of abstract, but something we know from um, work on social animals is that humans as social animals exist within um, dominance hierarchies and that if you find yourself on the lower end of one, you actually tend to have worse health problems than those at the top. In fact, it's a well-known fact in, in medicine that when uh, the rich get a cold, is, I guess is the expression, the poor get pneumonia. And that's not simply, and I mean, that does have to do with access to care and things like that. But what that boils down to is that your social status is actually directly connected to your physical well-being. So the idea that Harry's once glittering gold famous status would get tarnished and that that would have a physical effect on him, I think is a symbol for what actually happens in life mm -hmm. uh, is my first thought. So does, if that sounds crazy, let's not move forward at all. But <laughs> Well, it's just interesting how it turns out this bludger is um, bewitched by Dobby again, right? Dobby ah, strikes again. Yes, very good. And it's, and it's because it's because that it's Harry being the person that he is, the famous and beloved of all the downtrodden, um, that Dobby has done this nefarious uh, mm. bludger um, bewitchment. And so, so it's interesting, right? On the one hand, Harry's at the top of the hierarchy and is being attacked for that very reason. Mm. On the other hand, he's like, you know, he collapses into the mud and then has Gilderoy Lockhart tap his arm and his bones are gone so it's like he gets kind of the double whammy there uh and and uh Dobby is you know um very distraught about this as well right like that mm. that on, on, on the one hand Dobby looks up to Harry to no end but on the other hand Dobby is clearly capable of um doing some serious magic which is beyond uh the ken of his hero Harry Potter right so it's like mm. It's very strange to me how how Dobby uh, can look up to him so much and yet can um, do whatever he wants to him. On the other hand, right? It's 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 very interesting the 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 house elf magic that we see working here. That is very interesting, Miss Sarah Miller. What do you think about that? I'm I'm. Yeah, I mean, I I guess I, I take your point about how um, you know we've seen Harry's reputation get a little bit sullied i mean at the point where the rogue bludger happens he hasn't been accused of attacking tongue, justin right. he doesn't know anything about his parcel mouth except um that he hears voices um uh, but um you can talk but, to that one bow constrictor 
Yeah, so there's like a little bit of that. Um, before the game, Oliver Wood did put like an enormous amount of pressure on him to win, like catch the snitch or die trying. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I guess one way of reading it symbolically is he's being targeted by these incredible expectations. Expectations, by the way, that Dobby also has of Harry. Yeah. Um, I would also say that the way that the Weasley brothers speak about the bludger, you know, as the beaters on the team, um, they do. They're the first ones to know that to notice that it's being it's been bewitched. Um, ah, and um, you right, just give like, me a good thought. Yeah, so like Harry's not Harry's just like running away from it. I think he thinks it's <laughs> weird, but I don't think he knows enough about Quidditch. I mean, he's good, but I don't think he understands it enough to know. They're like, oh, this shouldn't be happening. And if he does, he's certainly not not the one to complain about it. Yeah, of it's, course. It's, it's it because because then he would be then he would be the worst of the privileged. Well, it's not fair. The bludger's targeting me. Like, <laughs> um, you know, Fred and George are the ones, by the way, also standing up for Hermione when she gets called a mudblood. Fred and George are the ones who say, you know, something is wrong here, and they're the ones who say, you know, we need a, we need a, we need a timeout. This is nonsense. Um, so. Before we saw the team stand up for Hermione, now we see them standing up to, standing up for Harry. But it, on, I think it's like page one eighty six or something. I really saw the bludger or one sixty eight, excuse me. I really saw the bludger as like a uh, an example of foreshadowing of um, like an object that has um, an agency, mm. um, that particularly an agency that seems to be aimed at harming. Harry in, in particular. Oh yeah. And yes. that that it's it's the middle of the book almost exactly. And it would make sense, right, at this point in the story for there there's already been a few bewitched objects. Um uh yeah. but for us for us to start seeing objects that, that seem to have and live as a mind or with a mind or a will, um like the like the ring of power or something, or this yeah. You know, I don't know if that that's how I saw the rogue bludger. I didn't really see it as symbolic of like, you know, his demon of fame or his well, uh, you know, the pressure the, he's dealing with. But well, I think I I'm think, doing. yeah, I think you did just, however, give perfect evidence for why that is the case, however, because the Weasleys are the ones who actually walk in front of him after he's accused and make jokes about it. And so what a beater is in this case is somebody who beats away insults at your fame or reputation and that's what they're capable of doing and that's why they're beaters and so i think i think you actually really proved the point and what you said rather than disproving it which is i think a very helpful thing to have done um so i think it can be both too i don't ever think unless interpretations are directly against each other i mean i think i mean i do think some hmm well this is complicated so uh, just to, to take your point of view on it about the idea of like sort of a uh, an agent identify or an object with agency, mm-hmm. which makes me think about like say the the genie's lamp in Aladdin as well. Um, it what is the connection of Dobby to the to how does Dobby relate to the bludger in the same way that Voldemort relates to the diary? I guess. Yeah, yeah that's I, a- yeah. That's kind of well. So Dobby is the bottom, right? Like he's mm. the lowest thing, and and he's representative of this this class of dispossessed. Like literally, they dispossessed. Oh, that's a good line. That's and, a good and, word. And then and then on the other hand, uh, we don't know it yet, but we'll learn more about you know the person who becomes Lord Voldemort. Like what his background is like, and what's possibly motivating some of his choices and things he you know the story that he creates about himself and imposes on the rest of the world uh the Mm -hmm. wizarding world at least and attempts to encompass everything but so like dobby is is fascinating because he has so much power right but because of his station he's not Mm -hmm. able to recognize that perhaps or, or you know certainly not allowed to to use it in the ways that would be most beneficial to to his own freedom so it's almost like uh, I'm because I can see that there's something sparkling there, but I don't know how to get there. So it's like an RPG or a video game, right? Where you see something in the distance, but you don't yet have the necessary 
key mm -hmm. of discernment. And um, it's almost like what Dobby represents is like what the Hegelians say is the master slave dialectic that he who is low in rank is he who learns to work and thus acquire rank. And so mm -hmm. Dobby, though of low rank, is of great power and capacity and knowledge and knows yeah. secret magic that others do not and knows secrets about magical folk, especially dark magical folk that others do not. So perhaps he's something like a psychopomp towards the nefarious means that will be used against Harry by dark wizards, including the arch dark wizard Voldemort. That is through the lowly servant that he will receive the uh, initial immunizing training for when he goes against the real thing, sort of like the idea that's paralleled in the dueling club with uh, the facing of the, the smaller snake and then the bigger snake um, eventually. Yeah, no, I, I think just from like a literary perspective, an author's mm -hmm. gonna an author's gonna prep you. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly we see J.K. Rowling doing that throughout in other ways throughout the text, right? That like even if you don't know that you're being primed for a big mm -hmm. climactic reveal at the end, like you have been, and so that's right? yeah. Do you think like, that's the magic that you're being primed without knowing you're being primed, so that? It well, I mean, so the, insofar as insofar as she's constructed a really believable, compelling, persuasive world that you feel immersed in, and you don't even really know that you've been, I mean, kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, tricked into believing that yeah, all of this pulled is in, like, sucked in. Like, I mean, that's that's where you get the. I mean, I think Tolkien calls it the Elvish craft. Like, you're yes. either mm -hmm. you're either you're you are bewitching a reader through your creation um through your words through your your you know the world that you design for them to be immersed into and that that's the magic i think i don't i think mm. in 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 doing that like the author can prime you for things such that they have like an enormity at the end like we 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 mentioned previously how mm. um you know, there's the reference to spiders and there's all kinds of references to snakes and they're not, they're not offered as like plot points. They're just offered as, as, as a metaphor really. in the staircase. Yeah. But like in our, in like, as, as readers, it's not, it's not like conscious plot. Right. Clues. right. It's they're just, just placed on the board pieces yeah. without connection. Yeah. And I think that the ability to do that is, you know, arguably magical, but also like something that you can do that you and I could do if we wanted to write a book. Like, uh, uh, But I don't think that makes it less magical would be my one contention. I think it's precisely it's, because we can share intention in order to create a narrative in sort of a stone soup sort of way, right? Like if you look at any sport or any endeavor, you can you can reduce it to its constituent parts and say it doesn't mean anything. Like, what is baseball? Just taking a stick and whacking a ball? But it's like, no, <laughs> that's just the manifestation of a competitive of a competition, which could manifest in many ways. But there's still definitely something real learned from it, and many things real, and that's why people give time to it. But, but I but think, like, the, oh no, good for it. But just in this story, it's as if. What they're showing us in order to have a climax, in order to have an ultimately meaningful or even possibly like, say, life changing experience like Harry seems to have at the end of each of these books and even along the way is that you 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 don't just have some experience out of nowhere, like just a miracle, but you have a small experience like these small spiders and then you see some bigger spiders and then you see the biggest and you yeah. or you see a small manifestation of dark arts. And then you see a bigger representation and then you see the biggest again. And same with the snakes too. It's as if what creates climax is sort of that like sort of Trinitarian three in one idea that you, you see the pattern as it develops. And then you see its ultimate realization as a pattern, as a constellation rather than as just separate events. So it's as if, like you were saying, you don't notice the pattern while it's happening until it all of a sudden manifests in its fullest form as a climax. It's like, bang, I think that's how human perception works too. <laughs> that all of a sudden you notice a pattern exists, even though beforehand the experiences all seem separate. And that, that 
that I think is sort of the the magic of the logos or the 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 real magic of being able to share an understanding with other humans. It's like, do you see that pattern? Do you recognize it? And I do think it is actually that's like sort of the archetype of the journalist who feels like he's crazy, right? Who sees mm-hmm. something that others don't see, but if they saw what he saw, they would all understand what he understands. Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. That, that's, well, it's like uh, one of the new words that people have to look up a lot online is gaslighting, which is ah. a word that I've looked up several times because I keep forgetting Get- what it means and how to use it properly. Is, is that <laughs> what it means, basically? You, 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 someone's manipulating you to, to the point where you're not sure whether the things that you're noticing are like real things, actually right. like problem sort of thing. It's yeah, yeah. supposedly manifests in bad relationships. Oh, God. Generally, that one yeah. partner convinces the other partner that their experience of reality is invalid in some way. Yeah, yeah. So that's like the bad version, or like the evil, the dark arts, right? Of like manipulating and adjusting the uh, so you, so you don't manipulate the, reality but you manipulate someone's perception of reality to make them maladjusted yeah yeah and the way that these objects are arrayed on the board right like is subject to many different kinds of interpretation so that's where sort of the the, the nefarious uh well so there's also this element of like uh objectively more capable people are also doing some questionable things here right like like harry potter doesn't tell everyone why they're in the hallway looking at the writing on the wall right he could he could say you know i heard this voice and mm, then let, let the honest. consequences play out right like once that information's out there maybe dumbledore can do something about it but as it stands it's everyone's sort of like freaked out partly because dumbledore himself can't heal the paralysis right away right it's like Mm. it's it's magic beyond the greatest living wizard right so there's this sense that like the bottom's fallen out a little bit here and it's Mm. accompanied by the uh the good people not sharing adequate amounts of information with each other so oh right that's really good that's really good because it also shows that if dumbledore is a figure of god the father then it is, it is an individual revealing what he knows but thinks is crazy to the, the rest of the mass, which enables the community to bind together to figure out the appropriate solution to the problem. And, because... and Hermione's, well, Hermione's solution is, is just nuts, right? Like, <laughs> she's going she's gonna to steal this, like, very dangerous book or, or uh, acquire it under false pretenses. And she's just like not being herself, but but it's clear that she's like freaked out, you know, because she's a mudblood. She's. Not... I would argue that she is being herself. Like, uh-huh. like I would argue that she. I mean, she's first of all, she's the only one who seems to have. Um, she has an understanding, right? She's she's really into the rules, right? But yes. maybe the one oh, thing yeah. that she's learned is that the rules um like can't protect her well no no that's not what i was gonna say i was gonna say that like um the rules are of of and codes of conduct for the hogwarts students are there to represent bigger rules right we've (sighs) seen we've seen professor mcgonagall not punish according to the letter of the rule but perhaps Mm um as as an opportunity to teach them like a grander rule or a wider rule and like what is maybe maybe Hermione's just a quicker a quicker study than the rest of them that like that's definitely like, well, that's true like yeah like that there are certain rules that are in place like kids can't check out certain books that are dangerous without the the express permission of a teacher <laughs> but like um that maybe there's grander rules that one needs to abide by i mean so what you said was about like harry not sharing that information because he's afraid about you know what it'll make him look like Hmm. to the rest of his peers well that's i mean that's a good person doing nothing in a situation where doing Hmm. nothing violates a wider rule when you see innocent people suffering and quite frankly hermione i see her i mean she's got more skin in the game than the rest of them 
Right. Um, like, maybe she's a quick enough study that, like, shit, like, like some of the rules don't matter if I'm a target in right in this. And, you know, and I, I guess um, earlier earlier this afternoon, I was watching some videos of the these these rallies happening in Texas uh, around this guy running for Senate who is incredible. Um, and uh, he, he got asked a question. His name is Beto O'Rourke. If anybody's listening to this and you live in Texas, you definitely need to vote for him. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but somebody, asked, somebody asked, somebody asked, um, asked him like what he thought about, you know, professional football players taking a knee and, and without getting into any of that. But what he, what he did was he just, he like rattled off a, a litany of examples of people who, when their rights or when the rights of people like them were on the line, they broke rules. Uh-huh. Like, like they sat at the lunch counter where they weren't supposed to sit or they, you know what I mean? And they broke rules because the rules actually violated a broader rule or sure. breaking the sure. rules, like served a purpose to, you know what I mean? And I, I guess I would say that she's actually being the most Hermione by and the most heroic potentially. I, and because... the most Gryffindor, most right. deserving of Gryffindor. Well, because, that's interesting. Yeah. Because she's risking the bit, like the thing that means more to her than anything else, which is her academic standing, or at least, the thing that on the outside, I don't think that's what means the most to her on the inside. But again, that's like, that's what happens later. But well, this thing that we know that she cares about her grades, right? Um, she's risking her, you know, she's risking a ton to break yeah. this rule. And like, she has to convince the other boys to break the rules. Like, <laughs> you, you know, I, I, I just like something is wrong in that situation. <laughs> I, I like so, which makes me think that she's actually the one who's right um, well and yeah you're you're opening my eyes to a couple ideas here that potentially the flaw in harry's behavior and not revealing that he could hear something through the walls uh to dumbledore who might then figure out what was happening because he had been there before and then would perhaps connect when the basilisk was there and could connect that event with this one potentially um, but that Harry sort of acts like a coward in that in that point point by not revealing something that could potentially uh, be misconstrued, and then I guess the wider rule that is sort of trespassed upon there is that you got to put the group above yourself when you have a piece of information that they don't have because it ends up coming out anyway, yeah. uh, unconsciously later to even worse effect than he could have imagined in front of everybody at the dueling club. He looks like a parcel mouth who tries to get a snake to attack uh, uh, um, uh, a half-blood, right? Isn't, isn't that what? Yes. And that's why Finch Fletchley is uh, uh, targeted. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. And with Hermione, I wonder if it's also that when survival, when it comes down to survival, certain rules um, lose their motivational valence and other more primal uh, rules become operant. And all of a sudden the rules of the school of the ordered situation don't apply because this is now a disordered situation where survival is at stake. And so the rules have changed, I think, like you suggest, and that the, the deeper, uh, more important rules, even than grades and standing uh, have uh have fallen away and now survival and and this increases their education right now hermione has to reach even farther ahead than all the students around her she has to go to the most advanced texts that nobody else is ready for and nobody else is in the situation or nobody has the wherewithal or is in the dangerous situation necessary in conjunction like hermione is to just put her at her limit like you're saying like she is her most Hermione and most Gryffindor because she is moving as far ahead as possible in order to spare herself and others because of her, both her political feelings about not being a mudblood, but being, you know, a great wizard, but also because of her feelings of survival or her desire to survive. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, if we, if we see some of her behavior as perhaps adhering to grander, like a, a, a different kind of order, right. Or like, reflecting at maybe like a deeper law like you said mm-hmm. like a law of survival or perhaps like a greater like 
greater, deeper moral code. It's like, it's almost as though following all the rules has worked for her, right? Mm -hmm. It's taught her, Ah. like, what are rules supposed to teach you? They're supposed to teach you what is good and what is bad. Um, they're supposed to, I mean, that not, they don't always do that, right? How to act in a situation. They're supposed to teach, and, and, and what, what is that? Is that, is that prudence? Um, um, like to see a situation, to know what to do and then to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, that's so, good. And that's good. And, and so, but has she learned through this habituation, hab- habitual adherence to rules and habituated study that like, mm, there are bigger things out there. Like, has she, has she started to access things like justice, the way that she is also going to access these really high level potions books. And then by the way, going to make it and it'll work. Yeah. Um, like, but I think, I think part of what I'm saying about her plan being strange is not so much that she's taking this step, which is outside of the, the rules a little bit, uh, or at least, you know, pushing them. Um, <laughs> you know, I, outside. <laughs> yeah, to, to, for her to steal a book from the library like makes a lot of sense to me. And for her to uh, interrupt a, a professor who's never been interrupted before by asking an interesting and pertinent question is again like very much in her, in her wheelhouse as a character. What is strange to me is her plan to get everyone to look like Draco's uh his his cronies you know and that that's her plan to like figure out the truth I found that it's it's a it's a dramatic like left turn that the story takes at that point it's like oh let's do this thing like here's what we're gonna do and I thought it was very uh like interesting thematically that it's it's like a use of magic which is dangerous and potentially against the rules or whatever like that seems to fit really well with everything going on um but like the specifics of it is like we're gonna make you look like uh these two these two slytherins and that's how you're going to find out the truth i just found it it's like it's like very it's very um out there and it's sort of like sudden she's like oh you weren't listening when state mentioned this polyjuice potion two weeks ago now this is the thing like so but yeah. I think it's pretty it's pretty cool once you start so, to like look at the the way it works. Yeah. So I have two questions based on that for y'all. One, the polyjuice potion and the fact of them identifying or becoming like someone else in order to acquire information. I, I wonder if what you're feeling there is that that is precisely the opposite way of getting information. Instead of identifying with the herd or identifying with someone who is not you in order uh in order to learn. You, you learn nothing about yourself simply by trying to be someone you are not. Right. I wonder if it's saying something like that, where whereas Harry should be admitting precisely what is unique about him, which is that he's a parcel mouth and can thus hear a snake in the walls, which is if Dumbledore hears that, that's clearly a basilisk who has been petrifying people, which is what Dumbledore will eventually, of course, figure out once he has the relevant, relevant information. Um, but one other thing I wanted to ask about the polyjuice potion to y'all is what, what do you think it means that Hermione, though she does come up with this brilliant plan, though it doesn't solve their problem, though it is brilliant, she, she messes up a little bit. She gets one detail wrong and it just fiz- and it totally backfires on her. She can't even be a part of the mission. Well, maybe that, maybe that comes from her being... And, and, you know, maybe I have to take back some of what I just said about this being the most Hermione mm. and the brain. I mean, on maybe, well, maybe I don't take it back now that I think about it. She but, maybe pushed her limit. Well, and maybe she went a little bit beyond her limit. Maybe, right, maybe right. because this maybe I mean, I will say the the one thing that to me didn't strike me as Hermione was not the plan mm. itself, but like the manipulation of a teacher to get. Yes. The plan. Yes. And so, and and maybe that is where this is like Hermione motivated more by the emotional than than the reasonable. Like, hmm. like maybe if she had, she's just like us, even yeah, though she's so gifted. Even though she's so gifted, maybe maybe this is maybe it's a sign that, uh, yeah, she's being brave, but she's also th- this courage to do what's right, you know, despite the rules or. T- maybe it was a little too 
rash. Maybe it's the, mm-hmm. it's beyond the mean of courage. Like, mm-hmm. and, and, and I think you also get that lesson in the fact that it doesn't work. Like right. they, they, they were again aimed in the wrong direction for right. their, right. So like, right. um, because, because I do think like finding, I mean, they don't have things like listening devices, right? So yes. how else would you get into the Slytherin common room? How else would you get that guy to open up to you? Uh, yeah, but it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting stratagem, right? It's like, we're going to spy. And the way that we're going to spy is by being in plain sight, but disguised so well, you know, that no one will figure it out. Um, it's like high risk and it's like very flashy. Uh, it takes a ton of preparation. It's like, it's the sort mm-hmm. of thing if you were like a brilliant young witch, you'd be like, that's a challenge I want to take on. Right. That's the way we're going to do this thing. And it's so it's it does fit with her character. It, it makes the story super interesting and it gives you this great like red herring. And it's a thing that Rowling yeah. will come back to later and use for, for, for later books. It's cool. But it's like, well, I mean, the, the alternative is like find this plan that is like simple and mm. discreet, and like, you know, subtle and well i don't know maybe that's just like a different sort of thing that's um i that, i think i think you've got it slytherin-y right it would be slytherin-y to do mm. which is what Harry is. He's she's playing out. their game i don't know is it is it slytherin-y i mean it's manipulative and conniving but there's somebody i mean there's no, no. a lot of risk involved in going uh, into their like i mean saying, you are the, literally identifying with slytherins yeah, no, the plan the plan that they've got is is brave and dashing and flashy. I'm saying that's Gryffindory. I'm saying that what would be Slytherin-y would be to be subtle and to go oh. and, and do something oh. that is going to pay off, right? And make you make you great, but is not necessarily like the cleanest. Well, bit I, th- of work. I I think what I see at least when when you mention that she's trying to be like a brilliant wizard, but not seeking the Occam's razor simplest possible solution. That reminds me again of the motif of the sophomore year, right? The Sophos I was, Moros. I was so- just going to say that. Right. Yeah, she's so going. sophisticated in her methodology, but she's a fool in that she's not directed in the right way. And so she, she hasn't yet lighted upon the right path. And I wonder also if that's, um, uh, well, so I mean, back don't, in, when I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they always said that the second rank, the blue belt was, was the worst rank to have because like a sophomore, you were now above the white belt and you were considered, you know, incredible, but you would always try the flashiest moves that yeah. always work the worst and are poorly integrated into your game. You know, the simple stuff is what generally works in everything um, uh, uh, and especially martial arts. And so I, yeah, I do wonder if that's sort of a con because isn't that a contrast with how well she figured out problems with simple solutions in the first book? She just uses the charm that they had learned in class to open the door to Fluffy. It's simple. It's almost so simple that you're like, how did that work? Whereas here she uses the most complicated solution possible and it doesn't work at all. I think also when you're 12, everything everything is of utmost dramatic importance, right? Like, and so, and so when Malfoy says, you know, yeah, you're next, mudbloods. Mm. She hears it again, right? We talked about last time how how quickly he goes from saying it on the Quidditch pitch and, you know, just around a small group of people feeling their revulsion and then saying it in front of the whole collected group of students right there in the, in the hallway and how he shouts it in front of teachers. And um, yeah. we talked about and, that and about, about like, about yeah. like, you know recklessness and when you think you can get away with one thing you try and get away with more and we talked about like the decrease in civility and like where like the the expansion of where the line is i think he sees that the situation is changing too but also does not identify the cause or direction of it but like so all of the stakes get increasingly higher right like everything is as you get closer to violence and disagreement everything everything is a little bit more emotionally charged. So Mm. when she says this, like, he's just, you know, he's just said this thing that this offensive word that, and, and, you know, the cat is petrified and et cetera. cetera. (laughs) A number of things have happened, but like, 
like like you said, like the like uh, the order has shifted. Dumbledore doesn't know how to solve this problem, mm. though I would bet he has an idea. Yeah. Um, mm. But but and so uh, far as Harry does, so does he. <laughs> yeah. But but um, like the the what used to be normal mm-hmm. is not is not the reality anymore. And so right. when things shift and change, and they seem to get increasingly dangerous, and people grow increasingly divided. Um, uh, everything takes on like a heightened emotional charge. And so what if like a 12 year old, everybody, you know, you start to see everything as, as, you know, riddled with um, high stakes and a high stakes problem to a 12 year old requires a high stakes solution. I mean, I've seen them try to get around like the rules or I mean, like watching kids try to break the rules is un unbelievable the lengths they will go to to get around something and you're like if you could apply one quarter of the ingenuity mm-hmm. that you are employing here if you can employ that like and direct it towards something good useful um uh, educational, productive, let me great. let me let me ask you this then do you think that this is the childish manifestation of what they think is adult so when they come up against an adult problem that what they consider an adult solution is an overly complicated solution that doesn't work as manifested by the false adult Gilderoy Lockhart, who gives the air of mastery without the actual skill to back it up. And so what Hermione is trying to do is to imitate what she thinks is admirable, is adult, to do the most complicated and sophisticated thing rather than to just do the thing that works. And we know that she's read his, all of his books from right. cover to cover and, <laughs> and has absorbed all of his stories and thinks that they're true, right? And wants so- his autograph. <laughs> right. Give away his autograph. The thing is, his stories are apparently really interesting, right? And it would make a less interesting story if you just say, Harry, like, go tell Dumbledore that you heard the snake talking, like, well, this voice you heard talking, whatever, he'll put it together for you. You know, that makes a much less interesting story than, like, let's get this book that is, like, really dangerous and has pictures of witches with arms coming out of their heads and people turned inside out. And then we're going to sit in the bathroom with Moaning Myrtle and make the potion that no one else can make. Right? So it's like, it's partly that as well, where it's like, if so you- are you taking Draco's point that they're sort of embracing the fame here, Wes, that they're oh, sort you. of embracing their own narrative, that they're sort of creating their own side quests in order to make life more interesting or that it's sort of, I'm, I certainly think that the, uh, I certainly think that JK Rowling is doing, a, you know, doing some work wow. to, to, to spin this thing out and to make, yeah, <laughs> you know, to make Lockhart more than just like a super absurd character, but somehow like the heart of this book, right? Like everyone is getting Lockharted as we're going along here. Um, What does that mean? What does that mean? Is that the, is that what Sarah was saying earlier? The art of fairy of getting us to read and center around this book, though it's sort of a a simulacra of reality rather than reality itself. Is that- You've got this situation where, like, so the kid is there with a broken arm. So what do you do? Do you take the kid up to Madame Pomfrey and, like, let her fix the arm? You know, like... Ah, so it's happening there. everywhere, not just her <laughs> or, do you, yeah, or do you get you get up in his face with your shiny teeth and be like, Harry, I'm going to fix your arm. <laughs> it's it's going to oh, be... Oh, so he is an embodiment of the sophomore, of the theme of the book, <laughs> is what you're yeah. saying. And that's so, what's happening all throughout. I think he right. also is... Like you, like we were sort of dancing around with like Hermione choosing the like the least elegant but the most outrageous, story worthy, right, um, way of solving what she has deemed to be a problem. Like they've all they've also assumed, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Again, yeah, that Draco is the problem, right? right? They've made these assumptions about who the real villain is. Yep. Never mind that the villain is like among we, themselves and they've constantly are, been been given the lesson that appearances are not to always mm-hmm. to be trusted and okay. um and like and, what what you think you know about someone is often incomplete both good yes. and bad um and so 
um, look for the moat in your own eye before it in your brother's. Right. Look and so amongst they, your own. They've, they've been given these opportunities to learn this lesson and they have chosen not to. Or mm. they have not yet been able to absorb that lesson about, you know. So about, do you think. About where, where, you where there's. But hang on. Like, yeah, I think, yeah. I think um, that, that like the, the search for the the, the um, fantastic among something that the, like the, the, the search for that is part of what she's writing about um, maybe with regard to magic in this world, but also like, like reaching for the, the most complex, um, you know, expression of magic and magical power in this world leads you to overlook some of the the things that the book is like basically about or yes. that the, it, it, you overlook the magic of Dobby you overlook mm. um the theme themes of like bullying and friendship and and like those things that seem sort of mundane and boring because they are mundane and ordinary <sighs> and they're you know what I mean like like going into Harry Potter world and thinking that's the only place where there's magic is 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 exactly the same thing that Hermione yeah. Is is the exact same error of Hermione in nice. like looking for magic in the Polyjuice Potion, whereas something else that doesn't require the flick of a wand and a month's worth of time could accomplish. I, I wonder if another way of saying that is that no matter how far we travel the world in, fa- in order to find the problem of our life, the only place we ever need to look is in our own hearts, at ourselves. And that each of these characters spins a web as complicated as possible in order to find the heart of the problem outside himself or herself. And that ultimately the problem comes from their own. Jenny, it's a Gryffindor. Oh, why'd you give it away? Oh, sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, (laughs) Well, in any case, well, because I think it's relevant to this conversation because that's what we're, we're dancing around. We're trying to... That's what that's how we're doing what the characters in the story are doing, right? Yes. That we're we're trying to come up with these complicated, quite uh, sophisticated solutions to these characters' problems. The mm. problem that we're really trying to solve is the problem of good and evil in our own hearts. Um, see, that's that's very interesting because the uh, the book, right? Like this thing that we're gathered around. We're gathered mm-hmm. around it because it spins this very interesting and intricate sort of story, but it strikes this balance as you're describing, Sarah, like that there's there's still recognizable and ordinary and and thus um, important, right, uh, sorts of elements that are that are in there too. And so it's it strikes this very delicate balance between uh, fantasy and the novel and then the everyday and the ordinary uh, that we can sort of Well, then, so we get this thing. All right. So to your point about like sophomoric nonsense happening, the dueling club. uh, (laughs) An actual wand waving contest. (laughs) Uh, Harry's spell spell causes Malfoy to uh, be tickled, right? To to be tortured by a tickling charm. And Malfoy's spell, counter spell, is to cause Harry to dance like a fool out of control. Uh, and, and I love I love both of those those bits of, of dog Latin uh, rictum sempra and yeah tanta allegra tarant allegra uh, yeah. I think I think that's just like a really nice like <laughs> image of of the kind of uh, depths to which 12 year olds will sink in their in their slinging of spells well you know something interesting about that too because of the pig Latin so there's the taranta so it's like a tarantula so it's like an image of medusa and in Allegro, of and course, spiders. you're talking about, yeah, again, spider, the very, yep, oh, dang, that's, that's an excellent connection. And also in Allegro, like you, were, like you were talking about music earlier, is actually usually in the masculine. And so it is to feminize or make chaotic his legs. And so it's also a, a diss calling him a girl <laughs> from Malfoy, right? It's, it, and, and it is his legs, right? Precisely where his... He, that which distinguishes him as a man would be right. um, and that he cannot even order his own legs, let alone his own house. And so it's like they're having a diss war. And yes. what's interesting about what hits, uh, I, I think it hits Malfoy in the stomach is a silver beam from Harry, 
Yeah. Well, silver in Dante's Divine Comedy is discernment, a reflection. And I wondered if that was supposed to represent um, an <laughs> insult or criticism causing unwanted self-reflection in you that causes pain to you or emotional distress. Uh -huh. um, and if that's kind of what a duel is, like an attempt to use your logos to hurt somebody else by, by, um, by uh, making them a passive agent to their own conscious growth by forcing conscious growth on them, by making them reflect on terrible things about themselves. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do wonder whether that is what an insult is and whether that's what a duel with a wand is between two people that just like each other to some, or to some extent. Um, hmm. Well, it's really but cool. Yeah. It's like, this is one of the first chances we get to see what like a battle between like skilled wizards would actually look like and it dissolves instantly into like mayhem and <laughs> and any like with the headlock uh with the slytherin girl so <laughs> milla milla bullstrode militant yeah millicent wow <laughs> yeah that's the only way you'll ever beat hermione with physical force not by you and yeah just attacking the source of all her woes try and rip her head off <laughs> I mean, Which is, yeah. I, I got to say, as I read this, this chapter, I was just, my teacher cap was on and I was thinking about the horrific lesson planning happening here. <laughs> oh my gosh. Gilderoy Lockhart. Again, so back to the point about and him Severus disarming. Think, Severus Vink yeah, was that's just true. as bad. Like, like and he was point. like, uh, I mean, they're just, I like this. I know we've talked about like letting, about how, you know, activity and practice is really important in learning and like how you, you learn by doing and, mm -hmm. you know, you learn by failure and you learn by danger, but this, this is not the same. <laughs> no. And I, I, yeah. So this what is, is Snape doing chaos, in this? Right. Is Snape, is Snape just trying to demonstrate the difference between a master and a fool by being, by agreeing to do this? Um, and he also seems pretty interested in getting Harry and, Malfoy to fight against each other he and is. breaking up the dream team as he calls it <laughs> there's an interesting Americanism yeah. in there um, and so yeah so what, why does Snape agree to do this he's usually he is a master of what he does and obviously also a master of dueling and of occlumency I mean he's an extraordinarily impressive fellow the things he can do when you see all the list of things he's incredible at um, and what, why does he face off against Lockhart and then I mean, Spelly armors him into oblivion. I think, <laughs> I think he kind of wanted to embarrass Lockhart. Uh -huh. Definitely, yeah. like this was less about teaching the kids to duel. Do you think Lockhart was James Potter to Snape, somebody with fame unearned, and that Snape wanted to expose him? There's certainly an of of that, and and I think it does have a lot to do with him getting a chance to pit uh, his protege Malfoy against Potter. You know, and and expose Potter to uh, ridicule if po if at all possible. But, right. <laughs> but we also but we also know that like we know that Snape isn't stupid. He has to know how unworthy Malfoy is as well, <laughs> right? Like like we've seen we've seen you know Malfoy's father is embarrassed by Draco's kind of mm. relative incompetence. Middling marks. We know, yeah we know that like he only got on the Quidditch team because his dad and like. Because his right. dad bought the broomsticks. Like, like Snape isn't daft. He's not. He's not. Uh, he's. He knows that Draco gets things because he of his last name and because they can afford it, and and so I think it's kind of. I, I find it almost pitiable that like that Malfoy is his protege, yeah. and I think it's actually his attempt to not dominate Lockhart, but his attempt to try and maybe get back at James Potter, but really to get back at Harry um, yeah. using this thing that he knows is, is, is insufficient. Like in a real duel, Malf if Malfoy and Harry had like read a dueling book and then, um, or like watched a dueling YouTube video and then went to a duel, Harry would demolish him. Right? And we already saw it in the, in the Quidditch match when the snitch was in front of his, like, like next to his face, and Harry embarrassed him. Right. See, so that's, I think that that's a fascinating image of Malfoy's whole problem, right? Like, <laughs> right. He's so fixated right. on Harry Potter, right, that he can't see the snitch inches from his own ear, right? So, yes. and 
it's like I think Snape's falling into that here too, probably. Like, and, yes, I agree. And maybe you know, if 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 Snape was a really good teacher, though this would kind of contradict really good teacher. But if he like, <laughs> if if like if he was trying to you know bolster Malfoy's confidence and say like, come here, I'm gonna help you. I'm going to help you like expel the demon that is Harry Potter in your mind. I'm going to put you guys in a duel together and I'm going to teach you how to beat him. And then you'll, you'll be done with it. And it'll be totally fine. You'll walk away. You'll, you'll, you'll have saved face from what you lost in the Quidditch match. If that was happening, it's a little twisted, but it's not like, I don't think that that's what's happening. I think Snape, I like, I normally, I normally, I really like the character at this point in the novels, I don't think you're supposed to. I think you're, you know, like, um, I, he is, I mean, he's like glaring at them. We know that he's good at his job. Um, not, not just good. We know that he's excellent at his job, but like, I think he serves as a, as a foil for Lockhart, but also as like a, um, like a, a secondary villain for Harry. Um, his, competence at dueling and at teaching um it just makes lockhart look even more foolish right well not and i wonder about the connection now when i heard you talking it popped into my head something that snake does is he also disarms he, he uses the ultimate disarming magic and so a couple of things about that that made me wonder are a he does show malfoy the key to winning he shows everybody but both malfoy and harry choose to be flashy rather than to use the most effective um, thing a good wizard can use, which is Expelliarmus, which disarms your opponent, which means they've lost, which means you can point at them and it's over, which it's like you rid them of the ability to make their own choices. You take Mm -hmm. their liberty away, their logos, their capacity to choose, um, rather than their capacity uh, to be alive, which is the Avada Kedavra curse. Duck. And, uh, (laughs) and, uh, but, um, so I do think he he models like a good teacher there, but is the youthful sort of sophomoricness um, that sort of keeps the boys from just doing the right thing. But I also wondered how that connects. So <laughs> Gilderoy Lockhart disarms Harry by taking the bones out of his arm. Yeah, literally. Snape disarms Gilderoy Lockhart by actually blasting him with an Expelliarmus spell, which uh, it may, disarms him of his his weapon, his wand. And how did y'all think those instances of disarming were either alike or different? Um, Like is one sort of a legitimate case exercised by skill and one by charm? I'm just not, Hmm. I'm not sure what, what that connection is. I feel like there is a connection there, but I don't know what it's, what its nature is. Well, like I would say that it, I mean, they happen so close together. The chapters are back to back. That they're mm. they're a good example of, I mean that's a that's a good example of Snape serving as a foil. Though I would argue that Lockhart is really the foil for all of the other okay. teachers. Okay. Because he's the thing. The negative side of yeah, teaching. Like, like yeah, the incompetent. The incompetent because he's the the one that sort of stands apart from the rest of them. Um, right. I'm not sure if there's, you know, if you can say, well, it's the the hand or the arm that governs the wand hmm. is there something related to 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 that i don't know hmm. yeah well yeah yeah Wes. Or it ties the mind to the wand or something yeah we do see like we've seen ron's wand woes throughout the book <laughs> and clearly for humans and students of magic at the school which is apparently the best school there is right the wand is key but there's also obviously magic that happens without wands which mm. again is like emphasized by Dobby's incredible power, which yes. I'm going to keep coming back to, right? Like, and, yes. and we can't forget Harry Potter as a babe was not holding a wand, right? He was right. he was protected by a spell, nor which was might his have mother. Been, right? But so there's some kind of deeper magic there, and like Dumbledore said at the very start, uh, th- there's musical magic, right? There's the enchantment, like literally that that root of that word having to do with like singing and and music, um, and the kinds of things. Uh, that we see um, just in terms of, uh, you know, the hugeness of Hagrid, uh, you know, there, there's obviously other weird stuff going on. Um, 
it's like you're saying that there's the magic which is rational, which we can see with the light of the logos, but there's also the infinite field of the irrational, real magic that we can't see with the logos. And so that no matter how much we ever see, we will always know by faith and by actual experience that there's so much that is real that we don't understand that we should always be, I don't know, humble in the light of it because Dobby is of course a slave and yet can can essentially almost kill Harry Potter, right? Well, he can and... he can do things that no one else can do in Hogwarts, like apparate, right? right? Um, oh wow, yes. Which we know from um, Hermione's annoying recitation of Hogwarts of history, <laughs> but like, <laughs> well, you, you can't. In, you, you're not supposed to be able to apparate in and out of the campus, um, and, right. and Dobby can do that. I do think that, yeah, I, I think to to tie it back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, uh, the power of the magic that that you were saying, Wes, is like deeper magic, like the the power of a mother's love, the magic there, mm-hmm. or Dobby's magic, magic of friendship, the magic that you were mm-hmm. mentioning at the beginning, Alex, of the how, magic of a story, yeah, the, yeah. or uh, or how like a um, the individual members of a group are um, improved, or their powers and skills are augmented through Mm -hmm. a fellowship of some kind like a quest Mm -hmm. together um those types of things that that like you can't learn in a book though apparently you can because they're in harry potter but like they're not um they're not governed by the flip of a wand or the combined you know incantation and a focus of your mind or something but um those are the things that a sophomore is going to overlook right after after a year's worth of of immersion into all of this magic they're gonna see the wand stuff as really cool right and like powerful and isn't that kind of what um we what not kind of but that's the seed of something that um that ultimately is what tempts voldemort which is the power over death that he seeks well it's the power over something the other kinds of of magic that we were talking about they either come from someone who is lower and vulnerable or they open more yourself up to vulnerability by virtue of your attachments to other people. Like Harry's mother's love for him is a, is a, is a magic that inherently requires um, what some might certainly Voldemort would call weakness, but, oh. but, but so there's, there, I think there's something, something to that, that like part of what the wise fool is attracted by um, it's tied to the fame that Locked that Lockhart seems to crave and like live upon, but it's the um the uh, the ability to be over something to be better. Because one thing I noticed is that he's like even when he talks to Harry about like the Quidditch match that's coming up, he's like, oh, I could teach you a few things, you know. Like he tells these lies, but they're always as a way of isolating himself as superior to somebody else. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah, he's without he, offering any real help. It's like it's part of the the fame thing. I think that I think his I think the fame is the result of people believing him. Right. And so fame requires an audience. But but what what's happening in internally in the in Lockhart, I think, is is more of a quest to be above, to be separate. Right. Um, and, and like and to be above and therefore like to have dominion over or be it maybe it's dominion in the form of knowledge or dominion in the form of control or something like that but they like he won't but but i i it seems to me like that's the thing that the wise fool wants um that the sophomore wants is like let me show you what i can do that makes me different from you um yeah and then therefore makes me better you know like Um, like he wants to be different without putting in the work necessary to be different at least in terms of skill and that even Um, even the person who is different in terms of skill like hermione right we know she's better than the rest of them she's different she stands out because she has put in the work and probably because she's naturally bright right but so so uh and she was a deadly combination a deadly combination hard working and naturally having aptitude but she doesn't crave uh, or she doesn't allow her difference to let her think that she's better than other people, much less treat them as though they are beneath her. Like maybe she does at the beginning where she's a little condescending about how Ron is pronouncing 
a shell, <laughs> but like Leviosa. Yeah, but like, but maybe that's just out of a, you know, an attempt to help. Like, I don't, I don't like heard anybody who seems like Dumbledore is a great example of somebody who is objectively better than everybody else right? <laughs> like he's more powerful he's smarter he's more experienced he's all of the things but he doesn't like i i don't know he doesn't seek to to like dominate other people and like you know walk into a room where they all defer to him and i don't he's not signing autographs even though of anybody no. at the school he's the one who should be right yeah um, in fact in the next chapter we'll see that the room he's in has pictures of all the headmasters before him. Right. He has the lowest spot at the desk. So to me, I I just see like that, that humility is part Mm -hmm. of what the wise fools don't have. And I I think it's something that Snape doesn't have. Mm. 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 At least. Well, well, I think this is as if the book has been getting to us too. This has been a very interesting sort of episode we've really been digging in and finding that perhaps the basilisk can strike us as well and so perhaps uh like in stephen king's book it a book can have fangs and like we'll of course see in just a couple books in harry potter too and just one last thing about the connection that we that you were making and that Wes made and that i said something on is what snape says to stop the duels finite incantatum it means finish the incantation. Mm-hmm. And in that incantation is the word canto, which means a song. Mm-hmm. And so to finish something or to make something finite means to limit it in some way. And so I wonder if the idea there is that like wand magic is a very limited perspective, a powerful and good one. And this is part of being sophomore too, that since you're building a new perspective, you forget about the existence of so many other perspectives all around you. Um, And that that's what they're constantly being reminded of in this text. There are giant spiders, there are weird potions, there are basilisks and there are emotional forces uh, and people getting crushes all over. And you don't notice any of this going on around you because you're building this one perspective at the time. Um, Absolutely. And maybe that's what an education is. I don't know, a leading forth or a leading from. That that's I wanted to bring up old uh, Filch. I'm uh, sorry to mm. the last minute, but the whole squib thing, like all he can see is that Harry knows he's a squib, and he's like totally irrational, like even worse than usual as a result. <laughs> and it, I think he's a good example of someone who never gets the the proper education and upbringing mm. to, to get out of that that state of like needing to uh, define things so limitedly. Right, that he's right. stuck. He's like arrested in that in that mode. Whereas these poor sophomores, at least they'll grow out of it, you know, if they survive. Yeah. So and Hagrid, as foiled to him there, Hagrid could feel the same way, looked down upon. But rather, Hagrid is extraordinarily caring and intimidating, <laughs> even though he's similar. And just here's a point that I think Sarah, uh, I think this is a point towards something I I found you to be interested in, both in the real world and in the Harry Potter world now. But I think something you might find funny is that I'm starting to detect uh, hints potentially everywhere in these texts that the old wizarding blood is running a bit thin, right? Ooh. Filch, Neville, Malfoy. None of these are stellar, stellar, stellar individuals. <laughs> Hermione is stellar. And I'm just, and I'm not saying that J.K. Rowling would, you know, consciously be talking about the aristocracy of Britain or uh, or of any there. ruling class. Gotta be there. But I am, I am suggesting that perhaps everybody in this world in some way or another ro- can- understands that changes are coming that are going to change everything that they cannot stop. And perhaps that is the, at the root of the conflict between those who consider themselves true bloods and those who are considered mud bloods, that what they see is the future in them, yeah. the strength coming from them and the wave that they will not stop and that that is precisely why they are putting up their defenses, because because that's all they can do, and they know that they're doomed to lose well, because they've been outpaced. I'm not gonna say one way or another like what she intentionally did. Sure. And I I know that there's some disagreement in the literary criticism world about the degree to which, like knowledge of the context in which a story is written or the biography of an author, should be brought to bear on the. Sure. You know that's like, less I, interesting I, to I, me anyway. Right. <laughs> 
I do think, I mean, I do think knowing, knowing like the world in which a story is created is pretty important, at least to me, to, to like being able to figure out like, what might this story be responding to? Like a very mm. well written story, like for example, something like Dante's Inferno or Dante's comedy. Mm. I think, I, th- good, yeah. I think you can read that and then like, it's so good that you can figure out the context of, you know, 14th century Florence, but mm-hmm. knowing a little bit about it, it explains to me why backstabbing politically corrupt liars and the treacherous are so deep. I mean, like there are really good philosophical reasons and theological reasons for those people to be so deep in hell. But I think I kind of also understood it. You know, like it's, it's, it's interesting. It might not be completely and totally useful and it's certainly not like conditional, nor is it like predictive of what something means. Semicolon, however, comma, um, I do think, I mean, take into consideration the world in which this story um, arises. First of all, in the last 20 years, there have been, there's just been this explosion in fantasy writing for young adults, right? Before there was like J.R.R. Tolkien and maybe Terry Brooks. Um, there were a few other writers, a lot of epics there was like red wall and stuff but maybe maybe go back further than 20 years go back the last 30 years or something it's been explosive right and then what is jk rowling writing in the midst it's it's one generation one like 35 year period after the de facto fall of the british empire and what's happening in britain at the time um is i mean the empire is not over um but like what's happening in Britain is uh, a lot of people moving to Britain from former British colonies. And you have um, like Eng- the face of England is changing. Um, the, you know, like the, the facial features, um, the common customs, like the, the skin color of the, of the, of the British Isles is, is evolving. And, um, not that it was always, you know, purely white. There were plenty of people who weren't, you know, well-bred Protestants, but, you know, they didn't have power. And in mm. in a, you know, relatively, I'm pretty sure it classifies as a constitutional democracy of some kind, but maybe. Yeah, I, constitutional I, monarchy. Yeah, but so there, there's voting, right? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. yes. But so, like, yes. people have more power. Um, people who mm-hmm. are different. People who... Um, uh, aren't Anglican people who don't look like every you know they, they don't look like people looked 20 like 100 years ago like the the changes happening culturally in Britain which I think we've seen like a reaction to very much with you know a large percentage of the elderly population of Britain voting to leave the EU a couple of years ago like you're seeing a reaction to those changes but she's very she's been very clear about writing writing this as a way to to talk about multiculturalism and um inclusivity social inclusivity versus social exclusivity and class and we'll start to see that more of course with like house elves and magic is might and you know like some of the some of the things that once the ministry gets involved it becomes a little more clearly a like having political messaging but the ministry yeah like once, once they become more of a character like in later stories, what they start to yes, do, and, you know. and they they begin in this one, right? There is a chapter called Cornelius Fudge. Oh, oh man. Is it? I forgot. Yeah, yeah. I just saw it today. I, it's not like I just remembered that, but it it was a it was something I saw earlier that I didn't connect to what was going to happen later. But I did see it then, and now it has meaning. <laughs> wow! Now I understand Interstellar. Oh my gosh, um, it's the magic. It's the magic. <laughs> it is. It is. And so, just one thing about you saying that is that. You just, again, did that for another memory of mine. In college, I read a graphic novel in my modern epic class as a freshman called League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And the very first picture is a fallen statue of Royal Britannia, which is the image or form of the the Anglican, right? The Angle, Mm -hmm. the, the, the England man or England woman in this case, or that original ideal that they had. And who are the extraordinary gentlemen? Well, they are men from different cultures. They're different heroes from abroad, including Captain Nemo, who is, of course, Indian. Mm-hmm. And, um, 
And so sort of the falling of the former patriarchal idea and thus the disinhibition of heroic images who now have to compete to form a, a new image of society. And perhaps what we're seeing in that book and in Harry Potter and possibly the world is the coming to be of a new way of seeing or I, I don't want to say it too big, almost a new way of seeing who we are, a new perspective. I think that's, on, that's exactly it. Yeah. And so maybe that's the real magic that we're, we're all trying to encant together and that when you, or to tap into. And that together. When, you, when you recognize the mundane in something as extraordinary as this, it helps readers maybe arrive at those conclusions, right? Yeah, it certainly helped us, huh? <laughs> well, y'all, uh, should we finite and cantatum for now? I think so. I think that's how we should end every podcast from here on out. <laughs> okay, we could do it on three. We could say it together. Yes. <laughs> Shall we? Should sure. we give it a shot? Let's it won't be it. perfect the first time. and It'll just be like in Final Fantasy VII when you're doing those presses and you miss it 17 times in a row if you're me. <laughs> so, okay. One, two, three. Three, Fanite Encantatum. All right, room for growth there. Room for growth. <laughs> was, that was on purpose. It was that, yeah. that was uh, Weasley twinsing it right there. Yeah, yeah. Peeves got in. Peeves, Peeves, who was afflicting us earlier. And oh yeah, listeners, you're gonna have like four, four conversations. And Wes, you can hear these too. I'm gonna put the outtakes of. Sarah and I just sort of riffing for one to four <laughs> minutes uh, waiting on you. And then we we're problem solving. And like my intros got sketchier and sketchier <laughs> as I, as I lost faith in your ability to get here, but eventually we came up with a different way and then you were there and right. well, it was magic. Yeah. And you started in media race. It was magic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, until next time. All right. Take it easy. See ya. Bye. Welcome back to Potter's Pockets, episode 11 on um, <laughs> chapters 9 through 11. If I sound very hesitating as I start here, we've had some technical issues so far. And so we're just now waiting to see whether Wes Shantz will be able to connect. And so something the listeners should know is that just as the students at Hogwarts are imperfect in their magical capabilities, so are we imperfect in our technological innovations at this point. Do we have you two here, Miss Sarah Miller and Mr. West Chance? I'm here. That's good. We have a major piece of the puzzle. But we're having trouble getting Wes, huh? I wonder what that could mean. Because he recorded something earlier. Perhaps we'll have to we'll have to like Hermione and Harry figure out what's happened to Ron. Or something here. We've become, we'll become mystery detectives of our own sort. Perhaps reality will parallel fiction in this case. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did we, he, we he recorded have... earlier today? Yeah, he recorded earlier. He he had a really good episode. I think it's episode twenty-eight on Earthbound, and he talked about music and he's relearning music. And I really wanted to ask him about that because he's been thinking a lot about flow lately, and sent me a actually sent me an article on flow in ants and so i was interested in his take on magic and flow okay. and uh maybe we'll have him listen to all these segments afterwards <laughs> so that he can and just have him call in and address them all uh individually um <laughs> is there a way for him to call us yes but it would be on his show then so it would be in a different place oh. yeah yeah but but I hope that that becomes a real option because since we're co-hosts, it would be nice if our shows could exist on each of our platforms. Hmm. Yeah, maybe we need to create a separate account so that the, yeah. the account itself is the show. And then anybody, each of us would have like login capabilities to call the other, don't you think? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. That sounds like a good idea. We'll just have to, yeah, just put a little bit of thought into that and make it happen. Um, all right. I'm going to hang up now, and we can check out back in with 
Wes, uh, okay. I can try. I can try turning off my phone and turning it back on, as well. And um, I mean, I find that like eighty to ninety percent of technology issues are solved by that. But yeah, Brett, that that seems yeah. And so many things. Just take a second. Yeah. Go reboot. Go take a nap. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Bye. Okay. Well, welcome back to Potter's Pockets, episode 11. We are here today with Miss Sarah Miller and Mr. Wesley Shantz. And before we even get into which books we're going to talk about, we might as well introduce our favorite co-hosts, Miss Sarah Miller, Mr. Wesley Shantz. Welcome back. Good to be here. Glad to have you. Let's see if Wes manages to make it this time. If he has the special spell that will unlock the door to this secret chamber. Sort of like... Oh, Wes, did you say lemon drop? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because I, I hadn't noticed that parallel before just uh, now having that issue with technology, which is what a having, a, having a passcode or a password or, like well, just being primed to see that it's not only the chamber of secrets that is a secret chamber that's being opened, but also, of course, Dumbledore's oh. um, uh, office at the other end so the bottom is reflected in the top and so i guess that old huh. Greek, uh uh who's like austere uh, it's like stars above and stars below and heaven above and stars below and the the unions it's a favorite sort of idea they have that's both alchemical and christian the idea that the father is reflected in the sun just as god is reflected in man and so you can find the deepest truths sort of like a Buddhist master or idea of a Buddhist master and the smallest physical things or the smallest choices, the smallest mm -hmm. moments in life that these patterns reflect. Um, but that's a very philosophical start. And I might as well say that we're talking about Harry Potter's chamber of secrets, Harry Potter two and uh, chapters seven, eight and nine. So how are you two doing? No, no, no. We're, we're doing chapters nine, 10 and 11. Oh, excuse me. Nine, 10 and 11. That's an excellent uh, correction. And so it's good that we have our Hermione here for when Harry and Ron just don't get it straight. Present. Uh, uh, <laughs> and so, so we, we thought, or I was, I was wondering whether I could ask you three questions today at the least, and we can talk about whatever else we want to too, because I think that Dumbledore and Chamber of Secrets, uh, connection is potentially interesting, especially because he's represented by two images of the divine book of Griffin, which is a, a dantistic image of, uh, Jesus, but also a phoenix, which is that which, you know, dies and then comes to be again. Um, Jesus. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> a resurrecting thing that keeps coming back. Right. And, and, you know, and it's like, yes. Okay. So we wanted to talk a little bit about that potentially. We also want to talk about the rogue bludger and what that means. And I had sort of hypothetically said that I thought that might be the presence of negative public attention or public mm. opinion of a person and how that can actually hurt them um, and their lives. Um, also, we wanted to talk about Gilderoy Lockhart, of course, showing his prowess again in magic and uh, disarming his, uh, Harry. And we were talking about how that potentially meant something like, I don't know. Um, we'll talk about it in a second. It, and how it's related uh, to dueling, I think. Oh, that's a really great point. And then... What was the last point that we wanted to talk about? Uh, it was Oh, Professor Binns and what we learned about the Chamber of Secrets through his um, interrupted lecture, but also like what follows that. Um, I don't know. I think in, in like at the end of chapter nine, the writing on the wall and then the end of chapter 11, there's like a lot of suspicion about Harry. Um, right. Right, and, and a little bit of foreshadowing, too, in that he, uh, he has shown face-to-face -face with a snake, mm -hmm. and we see Ron's fear of live spiders, perhaps suggesting that we're going to come face-to-face -face with, well, in coming face-to-face -to -face to, with the snake, Harry was doing that during practice and dueling, suggesting that this was just a practice bout, and that when he sees the snake again, it's going to be far more serious business mm -hmm. with more on the line. Um, but yeah, I wanted to ask you all about Professor Benz first. So he is a history professor that died and then just continued to teach as a ghost. 
and is never interrupted because he's so boring that everybody falls asleep. And Wes said that he identifies with that <laughs> professor, just like he <laughs> identifies with Neville Longbottom. Sarah, it looks like we don't have Wes again. No, I don't think we do. Oh my gosh. I can't believe I went that long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, let's just, let's try it one more time. I, I'll, I, I'll try and call him. Just, on, I'm, he just texted and said. Am I called? No, he said, I can see the notification, but every time he clicks on it, the app crashes. Oh, um, okay. I actually know what this might be. Uh, here, I'll text you both, but can you try and uh, um, update the app? Because I updated mine like two days ago. So there might just be an update. Mine, I don't Mine just like auto updates, but okay. I'll check. Yeah, thank you. We thank you. It, <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably on his, yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully that works. All right, see ya. Well, well, it's 11. Today we're going to be talking about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Chapters 9 through 11, a couple topics we might get to are Professor Benz's interruption, uh, what the rogue bludger means, and what it means for Gilderoy Lockhart to have disarmed one of his students. But before we get into that, let's uh, now welcome our esteemed co-hosts, Miss Sarah Miller and Mr. Wesley Shantz. Welcome. Greetings. Well, it's great to hear from you now. Is Wes on yet? Not just yet. Uh, Looks like he's not there yet, so maybe we're just going to have to wait till the magic starts with him. I, maybe we'll have to start the magic without him for the moment. Who knows? Um, so, Miss Sarah Miller. Have speaking, you? Oh, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, um, it might be worth uh, reminding him that he has to check his notifications to get a phone call. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Just as you know, at the beginning of a school year, it's best not to make assumptions about what we do remember and what we don't, but rather just lay things out clearly. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good idea. Um, we can start over. Yeah, we can include this as a as like a blooper clip. As an outtake. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's funny because outtakes people love when things go wrong, and people admit it, right? Like Jack and Chan movies at the end. Watch <laughs> I mean, that makes me appreciate how incredible he is because of how many times he like messes this up and then gets it right. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. I'll, I'm going to, I'll text again, make sure he's ready. And then we'll, we'll get back here. All right. Sounds good. All right. Bye. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.